Hi, I'm Kevin Cummings. At Investors Bank, we believe in helping our local neighborhoods and improving the lives of all we serve. We're a different bank that makes a difference for our employees, clients, and communities. That's why we're proud to support public television and the programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by Investors Bank, United Airlines, St. Joseph's Healthcare System, MagnaCare, Verizon Communications, Johnson & Johnson, and by New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation. Promotional support provided by NJ.com. Small news, big news, true Jersey. And by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. It's my honor to uh, welcome Ann McCormick who is a chemistry teacher at Jackson Memorial High School in Jackson Township. Um, 21 years you've been teaching. That is right. Former accountant. I am. And then you switched over. How many years of accounting? Um, oh, uh, three, uh, maybe four before my children were born. And then I went back to school to get my chemistry degree. So yeah. it was a process from the time that I became a mother till I became a chemistry teacher. Well, our partners at the New Jersey Education Association feature great educators in their classroom close-up series and that is why we're about to introduce folks to uh, this video that tells your story and then we could back we'll talk about it can we do that sure have you seen this before i have seen it yes well i have not oh, and i'm going to okay. join everyone else in appreciating this right now classroom close-up let's check it out so the computer scientists are doing one thing and the doctors are going that's not exactly what we need you are here so that you can do both. You're here so that you not only can talk the science, but you can also talk the computer talk. Everybody knows, especially in the technology area, exponentially technology is growing. It's, for someone my age, it's almost impossible to keep up. We, science knows that, and science is bringing technology into every single thing they do. The scientist that doesn't know how to use technology isn't being very successful today. And we see this as an opportunity to contribute to the world, but also to change the lives of our students. It's not just a new idea for us, but it's a new idea in industry as well, that we're gonna start bringing these ideas, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics all together in a single, competent individual who's gonna go forward and accomplish great things. Watch now, watch this. This is something new that other freshmen aren't, you know, able to, partake in and you know it just makes you feel special at the same time and the studies that we're doing in this program are going to be totally different from just a regular freshman class and, and this is more geared to college level classes so in the future it'll make a real impact into our lives so I'm really grateful that I'm in this program <laughs> so here we go let's see what we've got it is a lot of work but it's kind of like, it, you kind of know that it's gonna get you somewhere, so you're motivated to do it. I'm interested in the medical field, and I'm kind of trying to decide between being a doctor and a surgeon, but I don't really know where I wanna go yet. All right, so you're pretty close. We have a great crisis coming in this country in the future, and that we won't have enough scientists, especially in the computer science field we are going to have a huge deficit of people who can move us forward. And it's our job as educators to see that that doesn't happen. All right. That had showed up different when we were doing it. It said three and four for some reason. Oh, that's we interesting. Tried to, tried did to you, did you note the one and the two? Did you click yeah. on the one? Okay, well, okay. Was... well, let's see if we have it. Let's check. There's no sense walking away till we find out what we've got. How much do you love what you do? Yeah, I love what I do. It's, I, I, I have often said, both in front of my students and in front of their parents, sometimes I feel a little guilty when I get paid for what I do because it is a great gift. It truly is a gift. Um, everything is different every single day and almost every minute of every day. 
because every personality that walks in my room is different. And so they all are having good days or bad days. They are doing well or not doing very well. I'm having a good day or a bad day. But we come together, and we come together for one reason, and it's chemistry. And while I know a lot of, chemist a lot of people don't find chemistry to be the most exciting subject, I do. You do. I do. Because? Because I wonder at it all the time. I have never had to struggle so hard to understand anything as I do chemistry. And it's in the struggle and the success that I find so much amazement. It never ceases to give me a thrill. When something happens that's supposed to happen, something I could have predicted because of some kind of knowledge that I have, and when I can convey that to a learner, especially mm. a first-time learner, these STEM students are freshmen in they're, high school. They're in ninth grade. Ninth graders. Now, they're in the STEM. What's the STEM Academy that you're doing? The STEM Academy is a new program that we've started at, in Jackson. We have a cohort at Jackson Memorial High School as well as one at Jack Jackson Liberty High School. 25 students who were chosen, who applied, who had to take a test, who had to go through to many, oh yeah, many rigors to get accepted into the program. And now they will move together through high school as they fulfill the requirements of a STEM background, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. What could happen for them? Uh, great question. That's an outstanding question. What could that may, for maybe them? that's what makes me most excited because the sky is the limit. When they go off to college with the background they're going to have, any of these fields are available. And it's not just that they'll be a member of the field, they'll be a leader in the field. They will be making the kind of difference that this country needs somebody to make in the decades to come. And, and in education, we try really hard to meet the needs of all, all students. This meets the need of a special group of exceptional young people, young people that get science and want to use technology and mathematics to make it, to explain it, and to cause it to work for us. Beyond that, the STEM Academy is a trickle-down event to all of education. Because when we raise the bar for these children, when we say what we've done before for freshmen and sophomore and juniors and seniors in these fields is just not enough anymore. Mm. We're going to do more. We're going to do it better. We're going to do it at a higher level. Every student who's in a program that isn't the STEM Academy but is aligned to those programs is going to benefit. Because if we can do it here, well, then we can do it over here. So this has opened a door in Jackson that will never close again. It's a door for the education in these fields that is going to move forward. And our, we already have students from Jackson that make remarkable differences in the world. It is even going to be better in the future. But, but I ask you this question. I asked you this. We, we had a caucus New Jersey panel with Ann and three colleagues, uh, three exceptional, four exceptional educators. And we had a great discussion. And I asked you this somewhat facetiously, but I'm going to ask you again. When I hear and see, you know what I'm going to ask you, and you don't want me to ask you, <laughs> but I will. Okay. When I hear and see the level of passion and enthusiasm, when everyone watches that videotape from Classroom Close-Up from the NJEA, and they see it in your eyes right now, and you told us in the other program that you're retiring in two years, I mean, everyone has their own reasons for doing I, what I they're a, doing. I have a responsibility as I plan for my future. You're at the top of your game. Right. And, and I have a responsibility. It's a good question that you ask. I have, beyond, besides teaching the STEM Academy, I've also taught our advanced placement chemistry in Jackson. And last year, we were able to bring a brand new teacher in, and I was able to mentor her in anticipation of a process that's changing. We have 88 students taking our advanced placement chemistry test mm. this year in one high school, at the Memorial High School. That's more than any high school, I'm pretty sure, in the world. That's a program. Are you saying this is succession planning? <laughs> is that what you're saying? I'm saying that, that n nothing, not a program, not education, can depend on one individual. What we need to do, those of us that are experienced and enthusiastic, and good at what we do, we need to convey that to our colleagues. It just so happens this teacher we brought in is a former student of mine. So, <laughs> so, uh, what, so. <laughs> what we need to do is. To <laughs> this is a rational. Okay, I got it. What we need to do as teachers it. is keep the process going, so that long after I'm gone, we still have a hundred students taking AP Chem, All and right. the STEM Academy is vibrant, and young people are becoming scientists and changing the future of America. Top of your game. 
You are the best <laughs> at what you do. And I said this to the group of teachers. I'll say this to you again. You honor your profession. I can't even imagine how many young people's lives you've impacted on such a deep, deep level. And for all the parents of children in public school, we say thank you. I am appreciative. Thank okay, you. And wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this. Thank you. To see more Caucus New Jersey with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are pleased to welcome Dr. John H. Hajar, who is uh, Chairman and CEO of Sovereign Health System. Good to see you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. And, uh, it's good to have you. Now, this Sovereign Health System, fascinating, yes. started in 1992? Yes. What's the whole idea behind it? Well, it started as a surgery center. And uh, I finished uh, 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 training at NYU. At that time, uh, I was doing uh, a lot of laser surgery on an ambulatory basis. So when I first started practice, uh, I wanted to do something that was unique that could differentiate myself from the community. So uh, this company called Laserscope, they said that, why don't you write a paper for us and we'll bring in the laser machine and put it in your office and you go ahead treat the patients. So um, they brought it in and I started treating patients and it worked very nicely. Laser prostate surgery on an ambulatory right. basis. So wrote the paper, it took me about a year after about, we treated about 110 patients. And uh, once I wrote the paper, they wanted to take the machine away from me. <laughs> I said, you can't do that. You know, uh, paper, patients love it and right. the, the outcome was terrific. So. Um, why don't I buy it? They said, well, it's $200,000 for a laser machine. I said, I don't have that sort of money. You didn't and have it in your pocket? Nothing, nothing <laughs> at all. So they said, well, you could open up a surgery center. So that's how they gave me the idea of opening up a surgery center. I didn't know what a surgery center was all about. So I went ahead and through their help, they connect me to the Department of Health in the state of New Jersey. Sure. And we opened up one of the first surgery centers in Bergen County. Now it required about, it requires significant capitalization. I didn't have any money to open up a surgery center. You had to center. get other people. I had to get How hard them. was that? Very, very difficult. No one wanted to join. No one. Why, no one. Let, let's do this. Yeah. We'll do the long version another right. time, but right. why was it so tough to get people to invest? Because it was, uh, most people, most physicians, almost all of them are risk averse. And it was something that was totally unique and they said that it was going to fail. Why, we should, why should they spend the money to open up a surgery center that's gonna be closing down in a few years, they thought, right. and at the same time, it wasn't a, a concept that was well looked at. Or They're like, go ahead and prove it, and then we'll see. That's correct. But you can't do it that way. No. You need other people. <laughs> correct. You need, you need other surgeons to yes. participate to bring in the surgery. And that's 92. And that Let's was fast 92. forward. Let's For, talk today. What do you have today? We have uh, 13 surgery centers <laughs> on the East Coast. We have uh, surgery centers in Florida. We have um, most, of my, most of my centers are in New Jersey. We're building... Uh, we have one on the east side of Manhattan. We're building three more in Manhattan itself, and we're expanding. We're expanding our footprint. We want to go into Connecticut. Now, because of that, uh, uh, of that experience that I've gathered from the surgery centers, I've, I've, I've veered into other, uh, into other business lines. And so you have a multi-specialty group? That's right. Talk about that. What does that so mean? It's a multi-specialty group, which is composed of general surgeons. Uh, it's composed of gynecologists, urologists, uh, plastic surgeons. ENT, ophthalmologist, and, and primary care physicians. And all of these, all these uh, physicians got, got together under one tax ID number, and they in turn will feed in to the surgery centers. They will send their patients to these specialized surgery centers. So we have some of our surgery centers are centers of excellence in treating specific type of diseases. So we have a center that does just orthopedic surgery where hip and knee replacements are done on an ambulatory basis. You want, to have, you want to have your hip replaced? You could come to our surgery center, go home in four hours. Very specialized technical skills was required by the surgeon. You know, I'm fascinated by this because you're talking about a lot of clinical challenges mm. and a lot of clinical things you're doing, but what's really interesting is the folks at Ernst, Ernst & Young 2014 right. Entrepreneur of the, of the Year. Year Award. Yes. 
you become an entrepreneur that a lot of people recognize in the industry. Did you ever think to yourself, when you were 15 years of age, uh, you came here with your parents from? Aleppo, Syria. From Syria. Yeah. Did you ever think to yourself, I'm going to be a great business person one day. I'm going to be a great entrepreneur one day. Absolutely not. It that was wasn't never, the plan. It wasn't the was plan. Was it just required to do what you're doing? Well, yes, I had to, I had to do what I was, uh, in order to, actually in order to survive in the beginning. Because survive. Survive. Survive, actually. Well, yeah. quite, what, what, right. Devil's advocate. Right. Someone says, I'm just going to be a great surgeon. I'm right. just going to be a great clinician. It'll all work out. Doesn't right. work that way? Right. No, it doesn't work that way anymore. So in this, in, this, in this environment right now, if you want to be a great clinician on your own, you're not going to be able to make it, simply because it requires a lot of overhead. You have to be part of a larger organization in order to support you. And if you are going to pay a lot of, uh, um, a lot of attention to the business side of medicine, you're not going to be able to practice medicine the way you want to. Balancing act? It's a, it's a, it will be a terrible balancing act right now. In order for you to become, in order for you to become a good physician at what you do, you got to let the business aspect of that, of that, uh, of the of medicine to go and, and, and give it to somebody else. Well, hold on, but, but, but you are an entrepreneur. Yes. And you do understand the business. Correct. It's unique. <laughs> oh, so, but, right. but here's the thing, I want to understand th right. this. But you're still involved on the medical side. Uh, I'm no longer practicing. I stopped but, practicing about a year. But now. you're recruiting physicians. Yes. You're, but, but I see it's yes. a game of semantics. Right. You have your hand on the quality side. That's correct. You care who you bring in. Absolutely. You're just not hands on on the right. clinical. On the clinical aspect. See, I've been I've been on the clinical side, hands on on the clinical clinical side. I know all the upsides and the downsides. I want to make sure that the doctors come on board, do quality medicine in a cost effective way. I want to pay them well. They deserve the best that they can get as far as dollars are concerned. But I want the best outcome that's possible. I've asked a few of your colleagues this question, but particularly someone who's built what you've built. Right. It's important I ask this. Right. What would you say the number one lesson you've learned about leadership so far is? Transparency. You have to be transparent to the doctors. And, and transparency in the sense where um, what is the right thing that they're doing and what is the wrong thing that they're doing. And when you acknowledge that something is wrong, you confront it directly? Absolutely. Co confronting it as soon as possible rather than wait for it. Um, and once you wait for it, it just, it just gets worse. Hoping that, always tell people that hope is not a plan. You agree? <laughs> that's okay. Yes, <laughs> that's true. Hope, hope is not a plan. Doctor, we thank you for joining us. Thank Dr. You. John H. Hajar. Um, who is the chairman and CEO of Sovereign Health System. I want to thank you for joining us, and uh, we appreciate you shedding uh, light on this very important topic, and I wish you all the best. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank Thanks. you very Stay much. Thanks, stay right there. Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this. To see more Caucus New Jersey with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook, at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Tom Cardo is president and chief executive officer of the State Theater in New Brunswick, New Jersey. How you doing? I'm doing great. Great if to so, be here. If someone asked you, hey, what's so special about the State Theater, what would you say? I'd say, well, first of all, it's the number one venue in New Jersey for ticket sales, according to Polestar. Which What's is the Polestar? Polestar is the trade uh, organization that uh, monitors activity at theaters worldwide, uh, their attendance and their programming, and we're actually number 19 in the world out of uh, their top 200 theaters as far as ticket sales. So we're what's, very what's, busy. What's the hook there? Like, what's the attraction? The attraction, I think, for the State Theater is its incredible history and the brand that it has in the region. I was attracted to this job. I've only been on the job for four weeks, but attracted to it because of the, the incredible health of the organization and especially their ability to uh, be involved in education and outreach and engagement programs in the community. Uh, the mission of the theater is very strong and it is very active mm. as far as its uh, collaborations with educational institutions. Of course, we have Rutgers right there. Uh, the Mason Gross School of Music is right down the street. 
A lot of talent there. A lot of talent there, and uh, we attract some of the top names in the world. Uh, we do classical orchestras, we do comedy, we do Broadway, we do dance. Uh, a, a great menu of attractions that are, are very visible to the community and, and uh, we're very proud of the vitality and the variety that we're able to provide. You were introduced to us by some of our friends over at Investors Bank. They're big supporters of the Montclair yes. Film Festival mm -hmm. that we uh, partner with and do a lot of programming there and Kevin Cummings and investors uh, talk to us about you guys and said you're doing special things. How important is it to have corporate relationships? Well, it's it's huge. I mean, having Johnson & Johnson right down the street. Oh, that little company? Um, yeah, that little, <laughs> that little. <laughs> yeah, by the way, you mentioned them. I gotta say, full disclosure, Johnson & Johnson's an underwriter of ours as well, so go ahead. Well, uh, as a matter of fact, Johnson & Johnson just had their stockholders meeting in the State Theater two At weeks the State, ago. really? At the State Theater. Oh, that's great. Yeah, for the first time in, some 20 or some years, they decided to come back. They had a great time. They're coming back next year uh, because they liked it so much. Relationships so matter. They, they really do. Mm -hmm. and, and as you say, Investors Bank, as, as well as many other mm -hmm. uh, sponsors, are very important to us. You know, your background is fascinating. You make a decision to come to the State Theater, but 25 years in theater, where? Yes. Well, I started in Northern Ohio. Uh, with a small orchestra there. Actually, I, I have a doctoral degree in music and music theory and composition, and I was going to end up in academia. And as it uh, turned out, I ended up uh, running a small orchestra just as something to do until I got a teaching job, and uh, I never looked back. I ended up in, on the West Coast with the Pacific Symphony Orchestra. Uh, I ended up after that in Madison, Wisconsin, and ran a large <laughs> performing arts center for six years up there called the Overture Center for the Arts. Uh, and then most recently I was at the University of Cincinnati and I was the producer of uh, all of their opera, drama, music theater, dance, arts administration, and what we call theater design and production. So here, here's the question. You got the background on the art side, the musical side. Mm -hmm. You're an artist. But then you got the business side. The business side. For some reason I'm able to be lo both right and left brain at the same time. And I, I think I've been successful because I do have a business mind you know, that what I does can that mean? use. It means that I can temper the artistic and mission-based side with the practical business sense. So, so hold on one second. So you don't feel tainted by the fact that I asked you about your relationships with the corporate community. Someone might say, well, why, why, why are you talking about that? You should only talk about the art, you say. I say that you need to have a, a mix of entrepreneurship, business sense, and the artist's empathy. Or and if you I, don't have that, no money what? Finish the sentence. Well, no if, money if what? you don't have that, then you don't get along with, yeah. with the two sides of the business. Yeah, because the old expression, no money, no mission. The artistic side is, is, is a whole different world yeah. than the business side. I have empathy for the artistic side because I can talk the talk and walk the walk, but I also understand common business sense of selling tickets, raising money, and being able to watch the bottom line. So you have this great educational outreach program, arts education program at, the, at your theater, right? You bet. What is it? You bet. Well, we have a, a number of programs that we're very proud of. We have the, the school day programs where you look down Livington Street and there's... That's in right New Brunswick. In New, New Brunswick, Brunswick, and there's 20 buses uh, of kids that have come in the theater and enjoy you know, top-notch programming during the school day. These kids walk in the theater and they're so wide-eyed, they, you know, they're so taken by this wonderful space and the, its ambiance and then watching live performing arts on the stage is unlike anything they wouldn't see it seen. otherwise. They wouldn't see it otherwise because uh, it's very heavily subsidized. There's a very small uh, fee that they pay. Sometimes their school pays it, sometimes uh, they pay it themselves, but uh, they get to see some 20 programs a year, and we bring in schools from all over the state mm. for that program. That's just one program we have. That's good stuff. Real quick, uh, this season, tell us some things going on, some names that we'll recognize. Oh my goodness, we've had, we've had a banner year. Um, we Just last night and tonight, we have Crosby, Stills, and Nash in the house. Those and guys. Those guys, they're still going. That's great. And they sound great. Um, we've. We've had great success uh, with those top names. We have Ringo Starr coming next fall. We do a Broadway series. We have uh, four Broadway shows coming in next year. Annie, Once, Bullets Over Broadway. Um, I think I saw Anita Baker there last year. You might have, yeah. 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 She's great. We recently had Natalie Cole. 
we've had uh, Frankie Valli, we've had yeah. Liza Minnelli, um, any, any of the top names you might you ever get think the big of. names. We do. They want because of the history of. The theater. history of the theater, and it's a great space to perform in. We have a brand new sound system that's incredible. The acoustics in there are unlike anywhere else. And it just feels, the space itself is so historic and wonderful. People come back over and over again. It is the State Theater in New Brunswick, New Jersey, and doing, it is also having a great impact on the revitalization of downtown New Brunswick. And Tom Carter is the president and chief executive officer as of this taping only there for four weeks hopefully they're a lot longer thanks tom appreciate it you bet Great thanks job. steve Keep it up. appreciate it the preceding program has been a production of the caucus educational corporation celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence and 13 for wnet njtv and whyy Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by Investors Bank, United Airlines, St. Joseph's Healthcare System, MagnaCare, Verizon Communications, Johnson & Johnson, and by New Jersey Sharing Network. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Caucus New Jersey has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios. Hi. I'm Peter Rooney. In 2006, I lost my father to renal disease. He was on the waiting list for a new kidney, but did not receive one in time. Unfortunately, so many like my father have lost their lives while waiting for a life-saving organ. At New Jersey Sharing Network, we're committed to saving and enhancing people's lives through organ and tissue donation and by informing people about this important decision, because you can make a difference and save a life.